And now we're going to turn to an industry that seems to always be in the news. It used to be because it was going up, and now it's uh, going in a different direction, I'm afraid. Uh, but that's energy, uh, our energy outlook. And we're, we're delighted to have our Director of Natural Resources and Energy Research who will present the outlook for energy. Join me in welcoming Terry Johnson. Thanks, Pat. It's a pleasure to be here in Missoula. I actually uh, live in Helena and work out of Helena. Uh, I'm going to talk about energy today, and my primary focus is on oil, natural gas, and coal. And I think the first slide, the introductory slide, really says it all. 2015 was a difficult uh, year for the industry, and I, and I really don't think that uh, 2016 is going to be any better. Um, so before I actually get into some of the details dealing with those three commodities, I did want to take a minute and just briefly talk about the EPA ruling that just uh, was issued in, in August um, dealing with uh, CO2 emissions, and this is the Clean Power Plan. Uh, this particular slide I thought would be appropriate to put into perspective. When we talk about you know, CO2 emissions, we're really talking about a worldwide issue, and we're not talking specifically an issue dealing with Montana or the U.S. It's, it's definitely a world issue. And this just gives you a flavor of where the emissions currently are coming from. The most recent data that I have available is for 2012. And from the pie chart, you can see that China is the largest contributor uh, to CO2 emissions, and the United States is second. And then there's uh, three other countries that are listed there. And those five countries in total contribute uh, about 57 percent of the total CO2 emissions. And then there's another five countries that are listed there on the right-hand side, and they, they make up the difference. And of course, I lumped all the other countries together. But the point here is, is that China is leading in terms of the total amount of CO2 emissions. China is the largest uh, uh, producer of coal in the world, and they also uh, actually import a significant amount of coal. Now this next slide really takes a look at the contribution over time of CO2 emissions. And the, and the time frame here is from 2008 to 2012. And again, I thought that it would be appropriate to take the same uh, countries and put it into perspective of how much the CO2 emissions have grown over time, over, or at least over that time frame. And you'll notice that the culprits, again, uh, Saudi Arabia actually pops up there. We have uh, China, of course, and India is listed there. But I think the key thing is, is that the United States is actually leading the charge in terms of reducing CO2 emissions. And from that period, from 2008 to 2012, the United States actually reduced CO2 emissions by almost 10 percent. Now, the study that came out of the, out of the Bureau uh, just recently issued in uh, November uh, addresses what will happen uh, if those uh, proposed rules, well, actually, their adopted rules at this point, go into effect. And the point being here is, is first of all, as I mentioned earlier, uh, they were issued in August of 2015. They are revisions to the 2000. 14 preliminary uh, numbers, and from a standpoint of, of the time frame and, and how it is measured, uh, each state has to meet those requirements by the year 2030. And in the case of Montana, that amounts to a 47 percent reduction in CO2 emissions. And it's measured from the level of 2012 uh, 
to 2030. Or 2030. So that's, that's an important point to remember. And then because of our, our coal strip plants, there's considerable amount of CO2 emissions coming from those plants. So uh, definitely there will be significant uh, potential issues related with the coal strip plants. Therefore, that's why the study was, was developed. Now, the next chart really just tries to give you, a, I guess you could call it almost a hypothetical perspective, but, it, but I think it does illustrate the magnitude of, of those rules. And this, if you look at the bar, uh, it's the red bar on the right-hand side, that is the required emissions per the new rule that was issued in, in August. And if you look at it from a perspective of the coal strip plants, it will take almost the three coal strip plants to achieve that level of required emissions. So you have coal strip one listed there, coal strip one and two get you uh, part way, coal strip one, two, and part of coal strip three get you almost all of the way, but not completely. So that is an illustration of what uh, may have to happen. Now, in terms of getting into the specifics of, of the energy, and again, I'm going to focus in on oil, natural gas, and coal, and this first graphic gets into looking at some of the information that, that Pat actually presented this morning. This is just a year-over-year -year change in, in the West Texas intermediate price, and the reason that we show the West Texas price, it's the benchmark price for the United States. And most of the data that I show from this point forward is specifically either world data or national data. And the reason I do that, of course, is, is that that drives what happens to the industry in the state of Montana. So, uh, and then the other line that I, I just uh, superimpose here is the annual numbers uh, from that same time frame. I think the key point here to take a look at is you'll notice the similarities between 2008 and 2009 compared to 2014, 2015. Notice the considerable drop in the West Texas price. Uh, and it, I'll get to my point here very shortly. So that's the, that's the key number to remember at this point. And at this time, uh, West Texas prices are about 30, somewhere in the range of 30 to $32 per barrel. And that's West Texas price. The point to remember is Montana producers are getting somewhere in the range of $5 to $10 per barrel less than that because of transportation issues. So they are receiving considerably less than the West Texas price. Now the other factor, and again, uh, Pat pointed this out, is, is that we take a look at drilling rigs. And this is drilling rigs for the oil industry, just the oil oil industry all by itself. Natural gas, we, we look at that separately. Same type of trend, this is quarter over quarter change, and then I also show, superimpose, the annual numbers. And what we'll see is that similarity again going on in 2008 and 9, where we had a drop off in the number of oil rigs. And oil rigs is important because if you don't drill for oil, you can't produce the oil. So that's, that's why we pay attention to this uh, statistic. And then you'll notice that we've fallen off dramatically in 2014 and 2015. But the key here is, is to notice that on an annual basis, even at this point in time, we still have more oil rigs operating at this point than we, if, if you go back to 2008 and 2009, we have more operating than at that point in time. So let's take a look at the production uh, type statistics. So one would conclude that if you've got really, really low oil prices, and if you have the oil rig drilling activity that is way down, one could suspect that there's the possibility that you will see a considerable drop off in production. Well, as Pat pointed out, we're not seeing that. We are seeing a continual uh, leveling off of production. And if you look at that very last data point, uh, we are starting to see some decline in U.S. production. And I would argue at this point in time that as we go forward, 
we're going to continue to see that falling off more and more all the time. And the reason that we are going to see that is, is if you do not have the rigs drilling uh, for new production, you have your old production that falls a, what we call a production decline curve, that production will actually fall off over time and you won't have new production replacing that decline. So eventually, we will start to see more and more decline in, in the U.S. unless the drilling rig activity picks up. Now, the last thing I'd like to talk about with oil is, is that when we look at the, you know, the production activity and it continues to go up or level off, well then, then what is actually going on with that production activity? Well, I think this really tells the story, and this is just the amount of oil that is in storage. And you'll notice since 2014, and the, and the green bar just shows you that differential between storage and consumption. If it's above uh, the zero line, that means that we actually have more oil going into storage than, than we're using. So as we go on in time, and in 2015 those bars even get higher, this indicates that more and more of that excess production is going into storage. So it's not being used, it's just going into storage at this point in time. Now, this particular graphic, which is the last one on oil, gives you, I think, a really good picture of what I mean by that. And in this case, this is a, uh, a five-year average, high and low. It's not an average. It's a high period and a low period over that period of time for each month. And that yellow bar represents where that storage amount actually fluctuates from month to month. Now, if you look at the current activity and the current year, notice what has happened to the storage level. It has exceeded that five-year high and low average. So again, it just illustrates that a lot of the excess production that is taking place right now is going into storage. Now I'd like to just take a moment and talk a little bit about natural gas. Uh, similar trends, but slightly different. So the first one is, is production, or excuse me, price activity. And we use the Henry Hub price, as a, again, as a benchmark price in, in the U.S., and we use that to monitor what is happening with, with price activity. Now in this particular case, after the Great Recession, uh, we saw prices drop, and prices really haven't uh, recovered since that point in time. Um, and if you look at, uh, I think it's uh, period 2014, what we've actually seen is, is a spike in, in the price. And what that illustrates is the, how volatile gasoline prices can be to weather situations. In that particular case, 2014 was an extremely cold year uh, in January and we had a spike in the prices of natural gas. But generally, the, the natural gas prices have been quite low over this period. So with low natural gas prices, and again, if I looked at the rig count for natural gas, it is way down also. So one would expect maybe we should see a corresponding decline in, in production activity. Well, what we've seen is actually an acceleration in production activity with natural gas. And this just shows you the year-over-year -year change since about 2007. And you'll notice that we've grown every year except for one year, and I think that was 2013, a small decline. But generally, substantial growth in the amount of natural gas production. Now this chart really gets at, there's really two reasons why this growth in natural gas production is taking place. This is one of the reasons, and the first one is, is what is going on in the United States? The growth in terms of the total United States in, in production is about 3.5% per year. But the big red bar is what's happened in Pennsylvania, and that's the Marcellus Shale Formation. That particular formation takes advantage of new technology, such as hydraulic 
uh, or excuse me, horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing. And those technologies has allowed that particular field to expand significantly. So over that time frame that I have there, that particular production has increased by 56% per year. And it's only been in place for about four years or five years. So substantial amount of production is coming out of that formation. It is now the second largest production area in the United States. Okay, and the second reason why we are seeing such uh, increase in production in natural gas is what I like to call market shift. And what I, I think the key thing here is the gray area, which shows the amount of natural gas that is being utilized for uh, electrical generation. So if you look at the girl, excuse, whoops, sorry, <laughs> I set a timer. <laughs> uh, so if you look at the uh, particular period from 2014 to 2015, what you see there is, is about a 19% growth in the amount of use of natural gas for electrical generation, and it's shifting the market share from, or taking it away from coal. So th that's another reason that we're seeing the growth in natural gas production, because there is this market shift going on. <coughs> And now let me take a look at uh, coal here real quickly. Uh, coal uh, industry is having an extremely difficult time. This just illustrates what is actually happening with U.S. Or, uh, coal production. Continued declines year after year after year. And what we're seeing is, is environmental reg or federal regulations being put in place that is causing an impact there. Uh, we're also seeing limited export capability, and the next graph really kind of highlights what's going on there. So when we look at coal, we look at the domestic production or the domex domestic use in the United States compared to exporting coal. Exports have fallen off pretty significantly in the last couple of years, and again, that is primarily due to the fact that we do not have the the actual port facilities to export the coal, and other countries' prices of coal have become much more competitive uh, in terms of prices. Now I want to quickly jump to uh, some information on renewables. What I've done here is, is taken a look at the total energy consumption in the U.S. for all of the various types of fuels. And I've put it in a perspective of BTUs. And what this, what this particular chart really shows you is how much has that changed over time. And the period is from 2000 to 2014. So what we're, whoops, I went, pushed too quickly here. So this is showing from 2000 to 2014. The point being is, is that coal is losing market share considerably, about a 20% decline in use of coal for total energy uh, use, and where we're picking it up is in the area of renewables, and to some degree in natural gas. And the, the next chart really puts that into, pers into perspective. You can see the use of renewables and, and the components of re renewables. But the point of this chart still illustrates the point that the U.S. relies heavily on fossil fuels. About 81 percent of total energy in the U.S. is generated from fossil fuels. Now, renewables is growing and it is expected to grow over time. So kind of bringing this back to the outlook, definitely from a standpoint of the oil industry, Oil industry is going to have another difficult year. Uh, we, we definitely don't see production increasing. We expect production to go down further. Uh, prices may stay relatively stable in the range that they are today, somewhere in that $30 to maybe $40 range. And again, that would be a West Texas price. From a natural gas perspective, we do expect some increased production there, and there's a very good chance that we might see some uptick in the, the price of natural gas because of the demand. Coal is by far 
the worst at this point. We expect production to continue to decline. Prices will remain relatively stable, probably go down to some degree as, as companies try to be competitive with, with foreign countries. And then finally, renewables. There's a lots, of, lots of new uh, innovations out there in terms of renewable, renewables, and we expect that to grow into the future. Um, that concludes my summary on energy, and I'd be glad to take questions. <laughs> Yeah, from a standpoint of a clean energy, uh, how does natural gas rate? I've always felt it was a, a, a cleaner energy. And then, do you are there any uh, anything on the horizon that they're showing to clean up coal as, as a energy source? I think for, you know definitely from a standpoint of of natural gas compared to coal. There's you know that's why there's a lot of you know, movement to go to natural gas as as a source of fuel for electrical generation. So definitely, it, I don't have specifics, but I can definitely say that that's one of the reasons. Now, in terms of technology, uh, uh, in fact, I just talked to somebody yesterday in Great Falls about some of the technology that is being utilized to clean coal for purposes of generation. And it sounds like that there are you know, I don't have the specifics, but it sounds like there are some new directions in terms of technology that might be able to clean the coal better than it is today. Hi, I, my question is with regards to uh, the excessive importing of oil since we're having such a difficult time and we're storing so much oil, is, has anything been done or are you looking into the, or anybody looking into the possibility of stopping the import so that we can start utilizing that huge amount that we're storing at this point and get things back to normal, get our oil fields back in operation and, and lots of people back to work? I and I, you can tell me if I answer this correctly or not, but uh, from a standpoint of production activity, U.S. producers are actually producing, well, as the graph showed, a relatively stable amount with some small amount of decline. But that, that surplus was a worldwide surplus. So it's not just that surplus that I showed there is not just the U.S. So the U.S. producers are continuing to produce more and more, and I believe, I forgot to bring this up, but their growth in production, and again, this is U.S. data, from 2013 to 2014 was about 14 percent in the U.S. Now they are contributing overall to increased production. If you look at all other countries, all other countries are only grew, grew by only about 5 percent. So where the, the increase is coming from in terms of overall production is the U.S. But that, that total surplus is a world surplus. Okay, Dr. One more question. Uh, just wondering, what will make renewable energy sources affordable? You know, those who have tr um, priced out solar panels for their roofs or wind, you know, all of those kind of sources that certainly are clean, but they seem to be prohibitive in terms of cost. Is that just a matter of volume or technology or what? I think generally I would say that it's just a, as technology, there's lots of new technology that in, in the case of wind generation, solar generation, technology is catching up. And I think that's one of the reasons why we continue to see some growth in those particular areas. Terry will be available for some more questions uh, at the break. But before we do break, I, I'm delighted to bring to the podium an individual who's getting better and better known in Missoula. 
And that's James Grunke. James is, of course, uh, the CEO of the Missoula Economic Partnership, and he's here to report on some of the uh, activities and prospects for Missoula from his perspective. So welcome, James. Thank you. Well, I don't have a uh, magic cube. I do know what you're all thinking, which is, thank goodness we're at the last speaker, followed by, please be brief, please be brief, please be brief. I normally would have led off with, I'm the only thing standing between you and your lunch, but my good friend Annalise Hedall over here told me I needed new material. So um, we've seen a lot of data this morning. And as usual, I am so appreciative of Pat and his entire team for the great work and the information they've provided for us today. And I've been very fortunate that I've been included in this presentation in the past couple of years. So just like Pat did earlier this morning, he started by saying what they thought would happen, and then they looked back over the past years to actually what did happen. So let me start there. Two years ago, I stood up here and I said, I discussed what I called the year of the startup, which was really the first encouraging steps we saw in Missoula's recovery from the recession. Now I think every year has since become the year of the startup, with Montana, and in particular, Missoula, being recognized as the number one state and community for entrepreneurial activity as ranked by the Kauffman Foundation. We are meeting with new business startups now on a weekly, if not seemingly a daily basis. Last year, I stood up and said it was gonna be the year of the expansion, that all the pent up demand was going to finally be unleashed and highlighted several companies. And these expansions are clearly evident, driving around town, seeing all the activity taking place. Two examples include the new Consumer Direct campus, just several hundred feet away from here, um, and the expansion of Allegiance along Brooks Avenue. In addition, commercial construction will continue to be robust for the foreseeable future, with tens of millions of dollars of projects beginning to get underway. From the new do downtown student housing project, led by Farron Realty Partners, the Southgate Mall renovations and additions, the old Sawmill District with the first two buildings under construction and more coming out this year, Stockman Bank's new building, Riverfront Triangle, and the Providence Campus expansion will all be spurring significant construction activity in the coming years. There are always conversations about quality of life, but what does that mean? Missoula, much more than any other area that I have worked or lived, has an incredible sense of place and due, due to this, has placed high demands for the amenities and services that it wants. People want to live and work in Missoula. Why? Incredible quality of life. And quality of life is largely brought to this community via property taxes. Investing in Missoula's quality of life is integral to its economic growth and continued development. Quality of life is a strong determining factor in an individual or a company's decision to relocate to one area versus another. Are there great schools and parks for kids to learn and play in? Does the proper transportation exist to import or export my product? Will I have access to the fiber necessary to handle my techn technological needs? These elements and others make up the infrastructure that defines the quality of life, which will in turn determine the strength of our workforce. That said, as the need and demand for quality of life increases, so does our property taxes. Over the past year and in the future, there have been many bonds proposed and passed, and you can see on this slide many of them. They include open space, trails and parks, the recently passed school bond, and an upcoming potential library bond. Some may view the many things funded with property taxes as valuable amenities, and others may look at it as a deterrent for economic growth and prosperity. And with our eye on the importance of economic development as well as an appreciation of the quality of life, MEP believes it's crucial to attend to the creation of high paying, high growth jobs to pay for the quality of life that is being demanded. That's why MEP concentrates its efforts on eight sectors that have the highest promise for high wages and high growth and our primary jobs. That is jobs that produce a good or service here and they export their product and import new dollars to our economy. These jobs are the foundation for all of the jobs that are created here. They cause both induced, for example, if we had a new company that employed lots of welders, 
that it caused a local welding supply company to add jobs, that's an induced job. There are other indirect jobs. More people working simply means adding a new teller or a new clerk at a grocery store, and those are indirect jobs. And one of the sectors that we concentrate on for producing primary jobs is, is manufacturing. It's easy to forget that Missoula has a long history as a blue-collar town, but manufacturing plays a role in our identity as a community and for our economic future. Our manufacturing base is also much more diversified than it has been in the past, which helps stabilize the local economy. And I have the pleasure of getting to meet many of the companies in our community, and the breadth of skill and ingenuity is amazing, whether it be CM Manufacturing making aircraft parts for the Department of Defense, or Spectrum Aquatics making pool equipment sold nationally, or Elite One Source, formerly Nutritional Laboratories, one of the nation's largest contract manufacturers of nutritional supplements. Due to this history of manufacturing in our community, we've become a desirable location for expansion. This is why companies such as Harris Manufacturing, headquartered in Oregon, chose Bonner as the site for their expansion to target new customers in the Midwest and in Canada. Last week, at the Chamber's State of Missoula, many of us heard about the choices diversified plastics have made to become an employer of choice in our community. So what does that mean, an employer of choice? It's an employer who offers a work culture and a workplace environment that attract and retain superior employees. The phrase is more than just a buzzword. It is representative of a whole new design of corporate culture. It means that people will choose to work for you. It means people will choose to really dedicate themselves to your success. It means that people will choose to stay with you even when they are being recruited by recruiters from other employers, recruiters with exceptionally attractive inducements. In the years ahead, workforce stability will be a company's competitive edge. In these turbulent times, exasperated by a tight labor market, employers will be continually challenged to locate, attract, optimize, and retain the talent they need to serve their customers. The most successful employers will be those who legitimately inspire highly talented workers to join them and stay with them. Diversified Plastics example will have to become replicated across our community. Becoming employers of choice is important to the area's continued economic progress and will insist with the workforce attraction and retention that is critical to the quality of life that Missoulians demand and newcomers desire. The biggest single impediment to job growth today in Missoula is access to workforce. As companies and communities and states compete for workforce, quality of life will continue to play an ever-increasing role in where people are choosing to live and work. Today, over one in 10 Montanans work here in Missoula County, almost 62,000 people working here. And as MEP embarks on its next five-year strategy, workforce attraction will play a larger role in our economic development activities. We will place increasing importance in a come or come back to Montana strategy. We will also begin leading job fairs outside of Missoula, as it is important to go to other areas in the state and in the region to showcase why Missoula is a great place to live and work. We will be supporting the development of a job bank, providing executive orientation, and continue to look for increased collaboration with the private and the public sectors, such as the new proposed Masters in Data Sciences at the University of Montana. To attract the employees that we need, the companies we want, and to become the community of choice places a premium on the amenities that are being demanded and a continued reliance on property taxes to provide the amenities that Missoulians want. Quality of life does matter and it does differentiate. And so we must be vigilant that the jobs being created, the primary jobs, can support the quality of life that's being demanded. Thank you. And I'm sure there's no time for questions. Fantastic. I have a question. Question. Yeah. I got up easy. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much.
so much. Thank you again. I'm going to uh, announce a few things. So uh, this is this is a uh, another chance for me to uh, to mention and thank our sponsors who have continued to make these programs possible. I would like to uh, briefly mention them again. They starting with our principal sponsor, Northwestern Energy, represented by uh, Mr. Bob Rowe, who will be here in just a second. Our statewide sponsors, Benefits Health Systems. Uh, First Interstate Bank, BNSF Railways, and Republic Services, as well as the Missoula uh, Chamber of Commerce here, and also the, for support for the printing of our Montana Economic Report, I'd like to uh, thank the Commissioner of Higher Education. So once again, if we could thank our sponsors, I'd appreciate it. Uh, we have some folks in the audience I'd like to recognize. A couple of them, I believe, have slipped out, possibly all of them. But I know for a while there, our, our provost, Perry Brown, was in attendance. Perry, I think, has had to go for another engagement, as did uh, Larry Gianchetta, uh, the dean of the School of Business, who I believe uh, had, to, had to scoot as well. But uh, Scott Wittenberg, our vice president of research and creative scholarship. Scott, are you still here? Well, we can tell them we applauded for all three of them. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you, yeah. <laughs> we also have in attendance uh, some of the members of our advisory board, either current or former members. A uh, uh, current member, we have Sue LaRue from First Interstate Bank. Sue, thank you for attending. And uh, you've already heard from uh, one of our outgoing members, uh, James Grunke, who has stepped down recently from our board, as well as uh, Larry White. So thanks to you uh, folks. I also like to take uh, time in our Missoula seminar because it's an opportunity for my own staff to attend. And really, these are the folks who are really doing the real work to making these programs a success. So uh, we have uh, a number of them are here someplace. Maybe you can just raise your hands. I mentioned Eric Simmons, research forester, our uh, seminar coordinator and marketing director, Rob Van Driest who I don't see right this second. Is he raising his? OK, there you are, Rob. Uh, we have uh, John Baldridge, our director of survey research, is here. Uh, Colin Sorensen, our research forester. Uh, this is Colin's last day on the job. And we're buying his lunch. So uh, thank you, Colin. Uh, research forester Steve Hayes is uh, someplace. OK. and. Uh, we have our IT uh, manager, uh, Bob Campbell, is there making everything work. Our office manager, Deborah Simmons. And our uh, seminar coordinator, uh, Megan Alinsky. And our newest research forester, Kate Marcio. So thank you very much. <laughs> We'd like to uh, turn once again to the theme of this program, which is understanding the growth and challenges, changes in Montana property taxes. We may never learn to love the property tax, but if we're ever going to make it work better, we need to understand it. And as you'll soon see, our keynote speaker has a knack for doing just that, and that's making sense of issues and concepts that seem to defy understanding. It's hard to think of a topic that's more relevant than property taxes or more challenging. They don't come from Washington, D.C. They're a made in Montana product. We levy them on ourselves right here in Montana, and just about everybody pays them. Over the years, this program has benefited greatly from the unwavering support of Northwestern Energy. And that support is especially relevant this year since Northwestern Energy is the largest property taxpayer in the state by a large margin. So I'm delighted right now to bring to the podium the CEO of Northwestern Energy, Bob Rowe, who will introduce our keynote speaker. Bob. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, before I get started, uh, make a little mental note to yourselves of two things. First, uh, where do you think the electricity uh, that uh, reaches your home or business comes from? Where does your power come from? Second, uh, what's the, the carbon intensity uh, of that electricity? So uh, think about that. 
Uh, I'm going to give you a, a bit of a report on Northwestern Energy uh, and then introduce uh, whom I, I'm confident you are going to find is an outstanding uh, uh, keynote speaker who will really clarify a topic. First, uh, the reason that uh, we at Northwestern are as committed to uh, the, uh, the Bureau uh, as we are and the reason that I put on my calendar coming out to these seminars every year uh, is it's a tremendous opportunity for us to support economic development uh, around Montana and for me personally to really learn uh, what is going on in Montana. Uh, you heard James describe uh, the local economy just a few minutes ago. Uh, yesterday I had actually really a fun meeting with James, Bill Squires from Blackfoot and Mayor Engen and uh, talking about the exciting things happening in, uh, in Missoula and how we're very much a part of those. That made me think back to the first house that my wife and I sold in Missoula in the 1980s, about 750 square feet over on Central Avenue. Imagine now selling a house in Missoula at a loss. Uh, but at that time, this community, we were all in the middle, uh, really in the, the, the tough front edge of that economic transformation uh, that now Missoula is, is really uh, coming out of in such a dynamic and exciting way. And we're very excited to be uh, to be a part of that. So uh, a quick uh, kind of update on Northwestern Energy. Obviously the biggest news for us over the last year was successfully reversing the public policy uh, economic tragedy of supply deregulation in Montana and acquiring the hydroelectric system, uh, this distributed carbon-free uh, set of assets uh, across so much of Montana and dedicating those back to serve our customers at prices based on cost, not on what goes up and down uh, in the Western power market. So our electric system now uh, is fundamentally hydro-based. Uh, right around 46% of our system uh, is con it consists of hydro. So my, my first question, where does your electricity come from? Uh, the answer is primarily hydro. Uh, our 10%, uh, we, we own about 10% of all the coal in Montana. Uh, through our partial ownership at Coal Strip 4. That's an important resource for us, uh, but the hydro system is actually uh, the core of the system. Uh, on our system, we have more wind uh, than we have coal. Uh, wind doesn't blow all the time, uh, and Coal Strip provides a very, very steady base. So our system, by nameplate, is 70% carbon-free, 70%. The California target for the year 2030 uh, is 50% renewable. So we have what I believe is the best uh, renewable resource, run of the river, hydroelectricity distributed around our system uh, and meeting essentially all of our customers' light load requirements. Our challenge uh, for our retail customers is meeting uh, peak demands. Uh, during the Thanksgiving freeze, hydro system uh, was there meeting most of the peak, coal strip, Again, our partial ownership at Unit 4, uh, performing at about 99% capacity, as is the case uh, for wind in Montana, it don't blow necessarily on those super cold days or the super hot days. So wind, although we have, again, more wind than coal on our system, uh, was only contributing about 2% uh, at peak. So we have uh, this very diverse system. Uh, and that's uh, been, a, I think, an extraordinary accomplishment uh, for, uh, for us and for our customers to be able to get there. And again, as a result of the hydro-based system, uh, the carbon-free asset, if we had the ability to just look at uh, the carbon intensity of the electricity we deliver to our customers, we're already better, uh, lower carbon than the EPA target for the state of Montana in 2030 right now. Of course, the problem is, uh, that Montana is a substantial uh, exporter, uh, as Terry described, uh, that's a big part of our economy, uh, and it is an important resource to us. It's even more important to the industrial customers in Montana who buy their power uh, directly uh, at market. But in terms of the electricity, if you're a customer of ours, uh, the electricity that a retail a power uh, customer of ours, the electricity that serves you is by nameplate 70% carbon free, uh, and by actual delivery, almost 60% uh, carbon free. At the same time, uh, we've managed to provide rates at about 17% below the national average on the electric side and about $14 uh, 
uh, lower this year than last year on the gas side. So as I always point out, uh, supply gets a lot of it, most of the attention, uh, but uh, the investments that we make in the fundamental infrastructure uh, that's spread across Montana, electric and gas, transmission, distribution, uh, really matters. Uh, sitting in the back of the room a little bit ago, I got a, a notice, a car hit a pole on Mullen Road. We've got about 1,600 customers out. Our linemen, our, our professionals are out responding to that uh, right now. If that system isn't in good shape, uh, nothing else matters. Uh, if you're uh, with uh, uh, Missoula Electric Cooperative, and I see one person who is in the back, uh, you care a lot about uh, our maintenance and investment in our transmission system. Both those matter. Uh, so, uh, turning to taxes, and our taxes have been uh, in the news quite a lot. I think this is probably a pretty good setup uh, for, uh, for what Dr. Young is, is about to tell you. Uh, and he's, he really is going to uh, clarify the tax system. We don't, have a prop, we don't have a sales tax in Montana other than, for example, the local resort taxes. We depend heavily on property taxes. Uh, utility property, uh, our property, is centrally assessed. At Northwestern, we pay about uh, 33, 34 percent of all of the centrally assessed property taxes in the state. Uh, the second largest property taxpayer is actually Burlington Northern at about 7 percent. Uh, in 2016, our property tax bill uh, in Montana will be uh, a little over $120 million. Uh, and that does uh, reflect uh, a substantial portion of your bill uh, if you're an electric or gas customer of ours. Probably 12 to 13 percent uh, of your bill would be equivalent to uh, property taxes. Uh, we also serve, as, as you may know, uh, Nebraska with natural gas, South Dakota with electricity and natural gas. Taxes make up a much, much smaller part uh, of the bill there. And again, that's, uh, that's a, just a difference in uh, the tax structure from one state to another. Now, we don't recover all of the taxes uh, that uh, we pay in Montana. Last year, uh, we did not recover probably about $9 million. So it's not, uh, so there's a lot of skin in the game uh, on our side. Uh, one of the suggestions that's been made recently is that uh, we ought to be more aggressive in protesting property taxes. Um, and you, you may or may not have that view. The challenge, I think and we were, uh, this, this year we were prepared to do that, but uh, we're incredibly reluctant because we're mindful of where those taxes go. So instead we worked aggressively with the Department of Revenue to bring our, uh, our initial uh, assessment from about 140 down to 120 million, and we think that was the right place to be. But typically, we will be the largest uh, taxpayer in any community we serve. In Missoula, uh, our uh, tax responsibility is a little over uh, $10 million. Uh, you've heard um, at this point in these discussions, uh, you always quote uh, Chief Justice uh, Marshall in McCullough versus Maryland, 1819, uh, the power to tax involves the power to destroy. That's true. On the other hand, uh, we are very mindful of the role those revenues do play in local communities uh, here in Missoula, and we are proud of all the different roles that our employees uh, and, we, and we as a company pay, uh, play in the, in, in the communities where we serve. So striking the right balance is very important. And again, uh, Dr. Uh, Young is going to uh, really shed an awful lot of light on this subject. Uh, I can't think of anyone having had the privilege now of listening to him uh, in Helena and in Great Falls. I can't think of anybody who could possibly do uh, a better job. So just a little bit about uh, his, his background. Uh, Dr. Doug Young is an, emerit is an emeritus professor of economics at that school over in Bozeman, uh, Montana State, uh, and uh, has been uh, on the faculty there actually since 1977, taught full time until 2010. Uh, he has an undergraduate degree from Puget Sound University, and I don't think I mentioned this, but uh, our daughter graduated from there, uh, Doug, and uh, she's got a job and a career and pays her own gym membership, so I know that's a great school. Uh, but then Dr. Young also uh, went on to get um, master's and doctorate degrees from uh, the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Uh, now, think about really interesting, uh, fascinating places to work all around the world and just uh, tell yourself, where would you like to go uh, work for a year or two? 
Well, during his professional career, Dr. Young has uh, had extended uh, uh, stays in uh, places such as Botswana, that's a great place, Morocco, fascinating, Egypt, uh, fascinating, exciting, maybe a little bit scary now, Beijing, exhausting, uh, but uh, invigorating, and Mumbai. Uh, what uh, an incredible wealth of experience that he's brought back to, uh, to us here in Montana. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Doug Young. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you. I want to thank uh, Pat Barkey and the Bureau and Bob Rowe and Northwestern for putting on these seminars. Um, I have one other person I want to, uh, pardon me, thank. Uh, uh, Stan, would you stand up for a minute here? Um, Stan and Colleen Nicholson grew up in uh, Missoula. They went to prom together in Missoula, and uh, and then they left for a long time. And uh, then they came back and lived in Sealy Lake. And so, if you go back 25 years, then uh, uh, Stan is in his Subaru driving all over Western Montana and as far east, at least as Lewistown and Haver. And his his goal is to engage everyday citizens in in their local public finances and to get them involved in that. And also as part of his effort to engage, he also uh, tried to engage me. And uh, so he poked me and he prodded me and he criticized what I wrote and he encouraged me. And uh, so I, uh, pardon me. So I stand, I stand before you today to talk about property taxes. Thank you, Stan. And I also stole from his work, and actually that's the beginning of my, uh, my talk today, is, is I directly took it, this out of a paper that Stan, Stan is working on here. So I'd like to begin with uh, two quotations that actually came out of the uh, 2015 legislative session. The first one is from Senator Bruce Tutvet, uh, chair of the Senate Taxation Committee, and he said, it's not good for the state to have a system their taxpayers can't understand. And then the second one was from Mike Cadis. Many of you know him. He's director of the State Department of Revenue. And uh, he said, one of the huge challenges we have is, is explaining it, the property tax, to the policymakers so you can make rational choices, uh, rational decisions on how to simplify it. So accordingly, I'm not sure what you make of that. It almost suggests that the citizens and the legislatures, neither one of them understand the system here. So um, accordingly, the first part of my talk here is, is really directed at some basic education about, uh, about property taxes. Some of you, this will be very familiar to you, others not. I hope you'll bear with me and I hope you'll find something uh, useful out of the talk here. So uh, let's start with where property taxes go. Uh, the largest part of property taxes, $850 million this year. Uh, goes for education. A, a little bit of this, 16 million is for the university system and a smaller amount yet is for Votex, but we're talking almost entirely, uh, all of that is on K through 12. And then there's about $400 million that goes to the counties and, and they do of course roads, public safety, they do county fairs and a, a lot of other kinds of functions. And then cities and towns uh, receive about 160 million of, of the property taxes fire and miscellaneous district 67 million and then there's um, there's this category over on the right which is SIDs or special improvement districts and fees and and they're separated out over there because they are actually assessed in a little bit different manner than the other ones but when you add it all up it's about 1.6 billion dollars almost or you know about sixteen hundred dollars for every man woman and child here in in Montana so where is it that property taxes come from? And uh, by far the largest part comes from residential property. About $710 million is paid on uh, re residential property, commercial property, uh, $237 million, 
Uh, electric utilities and telecoms, uh, $289 million. And then all of the other property in the state. So think, you know, you got ag lands and you got forest lands and you have railroads and you have airplanes and you have wind generation and you have business equipment and you have pollution control equipment and so forth and so on. And all of those, the remainder add up to uh, $242 million. Uh, let me turn now to talk a little bit about how property taxes, uh, your property tax liability is determined. Um, so uh, it's a three-step process here. And so the first step is to compute the taxable value of your property. And that's done by multiplying at times a, a tax rate. So I have an example here. Suppose you have a residential property that's worth $200,000. That is to say, the market value is $200,000. The tax rate on that kind of property is 1.3%, which means then that the taxable value of the property would be $2,600. Uh, you may have a couple of questions about that. Where does the tax rate come from? That comes from the legislature. It turns out that the, the relevant tax rate depends on the type of property. Uh, where does the $200,000 come from? Well, that's, uh, that's for Mike Cadis to answer. No, that, that's, the, that's the reappraisal process. That's, did I turn it off? Sorry. That's the appraisal process and the, and the reappraisal process. Uh, so uh, in principle, all the property in Montana is based on, uh, is appraised on market value. That's actually a, a constitutional requirement. And it's also a requirement that the evaluations, the, uh, the appraisals be equalized across regions of the state. So how do they, in fact, do that? In terms of residential property, it's mostly comparable sales. Uh, that's, uh, uh, but for uh, commercial property and some other kinds of property, it's, it's a capitalization of income or even replacement costs. And all these methods, of course, are debatable and there's, uh, there's an appeal process, but it's really what the Constitution says in terms of how the property's tax is, is going to be set. The second step is to take the taxable value of the property and multiply it times a mill rate. And I, I, I tried this explanation on my family, and you know they said, "What the heck is a mill? Is this because you were in a you know an ag econ department down there at MSU and and uh, has something to do with grinding grain or?" And the answer is no, it doesn't have anything to do with that. A, a mill is a pure number, uh, just like a percentage. And so it really doesn't mean much of anything until you multiply it times something important like the taxable value of your house. Uh, a percentage is out of 100, of course. Mills are out of 1,000. The average mill rate on residential property in Montana this year is 606 mills. And so, or, or if you wish, 60.6%. So the second step in this calculation is to, is to multiply the taxable value of the house, $2,600, times the mill rate for wherever it is that you live, and then divide by 1,000. And so in this example here, that would suggest that the, the property taxes would be $1,575.60. Now, I have an example. Oh, look it. That's great. Thanks to Todd. He remembered to change to the Missoula slide from the Great Falls slide. So that's great. So here's an example from Missoula. This is actually, actually from, you'll notice, from a couple years ago. And of course, mill rates uh, may well have changed since then. But uh, we see 360 mills for education. W one of the things that uh, one has to wrap their head around is that these, these education mills, part of them are actually mandated by the, uh, by the state government. You may have heard of the 95 mills for K through 12 education, six mills for uh, the university system, and then often 1.5 mills for, for VOTEC. But then there's additional mills that are levied at the county level. Those are for retirement and transportation. And then finally, you get down to the mills that are actually levied out of the local school district. Uh, the city of Missoula in, in uh, 2013 was levying 241 mills. The county, 145 mills, or at least those, the, those are the mills that applied to the city residents, as, as is typical. County mills for roads uh, typically don't apply to city residents. And then uh, Missoula at that time had one special di district. I think it was a transit district, an urban transit district. 
that uh, uh, required about 20 mills. So the total added up to uh, 765 mills. Okay, so the third step then, we've got your, we got your, your house, we've multiplied it times 1.3% uh, and then we apply, multiply it times the mill rate. And then the last step here, the third step is to add these uh, special improvement districts uh, slash fees. And these are these items I told you that were off on the far right hand side of the, <clears throat> one of the, the, one of the early charts there. And, uh, and the reason for that is that, you know, all those other taxes, they're levied in terms of mills. But these SIDs and fees are not necessarily levied that way. Uh, yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. So, for example, if they're going to redo the sidewalks along your street, they may say, how many front feet do you have, and you pay on that basis. They may say, how many square feet is there in your lot, and you pay on that basis. They may be just so much per lot. So they're out, outside of the mill system, is what I want to say, or some of them are outside of the mill system. Let's see, are these important? Well, it depends on exactly where you live. Uh, I looked at my property tax bill. I live just outside the city of Bozeman, and these uh, SIDs and fees add about 6% to the total. I know somebody else here in Missoula, and I looked at their property tax bill from a year or so ago, not the, not the current one, and they, these items added 28% to the property tax bill. So it's location, 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 uh, in terms of exactly where you are. In fact, I wanted to mention that, and I failed to, I, I guess, I, to, just to reinforce it. Think about how many taxing districts there are in Montana. You know, we have one state, we have 56 counties, we have 120 municipalities, we have something like 350 school districts, and then we have all those special districts and mosquito control districts and everything else. So your, your, your property tax bill is just crucial in terms of I exactly where, where you are located. Um, let's see, I mentioned before that uh, different types of property have different tax rates that are applied to them. Montana has one of the most complicated property tax classification systems in the country. There are 13 different classes of property. There are 14 different tax rates. They range from 0.4% uh, on forest land to 12% uh, is the highest on non-electrical generating property of uh, electrical utilities. Uh, as one consequence of these different tax rates is that then the taxes that are paid don't really line up one for one with uh, market value. So for example, we see that 48% uh, of the property taxes are paid on residential property but residential property actually uh, 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 is 65 percent of the total market value of taxable property in Montana. So why is it that the taxes are, are less? Well, the, the tax rate on the, the, the residential property is 1.3 percent. The average tax rate over the whole property tax base is 1.94 percent. So the fact that residential property is taxed at a lower rate than, than average then that just has to be the case. The, then the taxes that paid on the residential property are are lower. Uh, in contrast, look at the opposite. Look at the third set of bars over there: the electrical utilities and telecom property. They pay 20% uh, of the taxes, even though uh, their share of the taxable value of a property is is only 5%. And again, the difference is those those higher tax rates on that kind of property. Let's see, I think, I think Pat and Bob have probably uh, made the point that, of course, the liability for the tax is not necessarily who bears the burden for the tax. In the case of utility property in particular, most of that is passed along and becomes a tax on electricity and natural gas. So uh, let's continue. Uh, let's see. Oh, I, this is where it starts to get more fun, more interesting, because we make some comparisons among the communities. and so. I mean, it's one thing in abstract to say what your taxes are, but when you find out your taxes are higher or lower than somebody else's, then people uh, become more interested here. So this is, again, fiscal year 2013 data. We're talking about a piece of property that is located in, in the town. So we have city taxes, school taxes, county taxes, and so forth and so on. And if you just look over this chart here, 
uh, which, which, uh, which municipality has the lowest tax rate? That's uh, 603 mills in Bozeman. Which municipality has the highest tax rate? That's Haver at 816 mills. So, so why do we care about these pesky, pesky mills? Well, the answer is this. Remember that if, if, uh, if you have two properties of equal value, and one of them is located in Bozeman, and one of them is located in Haver, then the one in Haver is going to pay 35% more in property taxes than the one in Bozeman, because 816 is 35% more than 603. A lot of people don't like that. They, well, the prices are so different between Haver and Bozeman. Let's compare a Missoula, for example. So we see Missoula down there at 765 mills. That's 26% more than the mill levy in Bozeman. So that says two houses of equal value. The one in Missoula pays 26% more in property taxes than the one in Bozeman. Okay. Let's go one more here. Uh, let, I want to look at Great Falls for a second. Great Falls is not uh, Great Falls is below average in terms of its mill levy, 680 mills, and uh, but it's the third lowest up there on the chart. So the next question is, you know, why do these mill levies vary? Why do we see these differences uh, across the different uh, uh, the, the different communities? So there's three reasons. We're on the, th the threesome talk today. So there's three reasons why the mill levies vary, or at least three reasons. The first one is the tax base. And this is also known as the mill value. And what is mill value? Mill value says, if we levy one mill, how much money do we generate? And the idea we're talking about, how much revenue do we generate? And, and the idea is the following. Uh, if you levy one mill and you get a lot of money, you don't have to levy too many mills. On the other hand, if you levy one mill and you don't get much money, you may well end up levying more mills. Yes? OK. So uh, let's try this. Let's look at uh, this is for fiscal year 2014. This is a city, the mill values in cities. And uh, so uh, look at that chart. Who's got the highest mill value? Wait, pardon me. Pardon me. The, the cities vary a great deal in, in population, so the mill values are expressed per person, right? Important factor here. So look at Bozeman. When they levy one mill, they get revenue of $2.15 per person. If we, uh, and guess what? They have the lowest mills. Who's at the opposite end of the spectrum? When Haver levies one mill, they raise 87 cents. And guess what? They levy the most mills. OK? Principle one. But this does not explain everything about the variation in mill rates among the different communities here. Look at Missoula. Look at Missoula. Its, it's, it's tax base, its mill value, is near average. It's actually a, a little bit below average for the AA schools, but it's close to average. But it had, you know, the highest mills levied among the AA, AA communities. So why is that? Why is that? Well, there's more than one factor here. The second factor is even easier. The second factor is government spending. If the government spends more money, they need to levy higher taxes. If the government spends less money, they levy lower taxes. OK, let's see here. So let's look at city spending. And of course, you know, in terms of your total mill levy, it's not just city spending. It's county spending. It's school spending. The state mills, of course, are the same every, every, all across the state. But for these other factors, so if we look at city spending, uh, you know, who spends the most per capita? Then it's Missoula. So why are Missoula's mills relatively high? Well, because they spend relatively large amounts of money. Okay? And, and you know, let's, Mr. Grumpke talked to us about to the value of spending lots of money. Right? This is a nice place. My kids came here for swim meets outdoors. It's nice. Uh, but that's it. That's the, that's the connection, uh, is a high level of spending. Look at Great Falls, because Great Falls is kind of interesting. Uh, sorry, I, 
I, I lost my track here. Look at, look at Great Falls. Remember, we saw their mills were fairly low. And look at their, their mill value is also pretty low. So how can they do this? How can they, they don't have a big tax base, but they don't have very high mills either. So how can they do that? Look what they spend. OK? This isn't rocket science. <laughs> OK, uh, then the, the, the last part is the other thing I want to bring in is I want to come back to this issue of the, the total mills with, uh, I want to come back to these SIDs and fees. And as I've said, they are of, oftentimes not assessed in terms of mills. It might be feet or whatever, right? But what we can do is we can say, we can look at all the revenue that is being collected and say, how many mills would the jurisdictions have, would they have had to levy in order to generate that revenue? And in fact, uh, somebody in the finance department here in Missoula is the one that suggested to me to, uh, to take this approach here. And uh, these data are a little bit different. They're at the county level rather than at the city level. And, and the reason for that is just data availability. I got, the, I got this data at the county level and I don't, don't have it at, at the city level here. So uh, what, what the blue lines indicate here is, the, the blue lines are the average mills levied in these various counties. This is the average over you know, both Missoula and, and, and rural Missoula County and so forth and so on. It's the average mills that are actually levied. And then the black extension on there is, look at how much they're collecting in SIDs and fees and say, how many mills would they have had to levy in order to generate that much revenue? And of course, what jumps out at you is what's happening down there in Silver Bow County. The SIDs and fees are the equivalent of levy levying 255 mills. And so when you add that on, then the effective total mill rate is like 984 mills. Okay, you with me? And I want to point out Missoula here. You see, overall in Missoula County, the, it's they don't rely particularly heavy on SIDs and fees. Okay, so kind of yeah, you guys got high mills, but SIDs and fees on average throughout the county are not that high. Despite the person I knew who got 28% bump in their property tax bill. Okay, so that's just one example. Okay, let's see here. Um, so those are the three reasons why we talk about uh, uh, mill levies varying as you go around the state. One is the tax base, the second is the government spending, and the third is other revenue sources. And I, and I focused on the SIDs and fees because they show up on your property tax bill, and that's what we're, we're talking about today. But of course, there's other revenue sources as well. You know, there are grants from uh, or what they call intergovernmental transfers from the state government, from the federal government. There's a variety of other revenue sources down in my part of the world. There are impact fees. There's, there's a number of things that are, are potentially outside of the property tax. So uh, the, the reliance on those other revenue sources then also affects the, the mill levies. Okay, uh, the title of this talk is Rising Property Taxes, and so we have to bring the time dimension in here. Part of the t time dimension is that I'm on time for the first time in this series of tours. Uh, the, uh, the, the time dimension here, we want to look at what's happened to property taxes over the last 20 years. And so uh, the, the, this compares 1995 and 2015. And these are total property taxes statewide in, in Montana. Uh, the red bars are the total property taxes. The green bars are the property taxes on residential property. And so have property taxes, in fact, increased? Yes. They've, in fact, they've doubled from uh, 700 million to, pardon me, almost $1.6 billion. And uh, look at the green bars, though. I mean, they've increased even faster in, in, a, in a percentage sense. They have, uh, they have almost tripled from $214 million to $682 million. But if there are any economists in the crowd, they would be you know, yelling at me at this point and saying, you can't do that, Doug. You just can't do that. That's, that's 20 years. What about inflation? What about population growth? What about income growth? 
Okay. So let's look at these same numbers expressed as a percentage of income. The measure of income that's used here is personal income. It's a very broad measure of income. It includes not just wages and salaries, but also self-employment income from farms and ranches and, and other kinds of businesses. It includes capital income from dividends, interest, and rents. It includes transfer payments like, like Social Security. And, and gauging taxes relative to uh, income is really attractive for two reasons. First, income is a very basic measure of ability to pay. If you ain't got the income, you may not have the ability to pay. And then secondly, you know, income really drives the demand for public services as well. When, when our incomes go up, people want not just bigger and better houses, bigger and better SUVs. Well, maybe that's just down Bozeman. Uh, that's it. But uh, yeah, I, but you know what? They also like to have their roads in better condition. They like better parks. They like outdoor swimming pools. They like better schools. So really the income thing is both driving the ability to pay and it's also driving on the other side, the demand for the public services here. So what is perhaps uh, surprising to the audiences is that uh, if you look at total property taxes in Montana, actually income has increased faster than property taxes. So the total property taxes actually fell from 4.5% of personal income down to 3.9%. But if you look at the green bars, of course, and most people are more closely attuned to the property taxes on their house than on total property taxes. If you look at the to property taxes on residential property, they've actually increased from 1.5% to 2% of personal income. So we have a little bit of a puzzle, you know, why has one shrunk and the other increased, in particular, why is the residential portion increased? But again, the answer is, is not difficult here. The answer is fairly straightforward. What's happened is that the value of residential property has increased so much faster than all of the other property in Montana that, hey, we get more taxes off of residential property. I, again, you know, property taxes are based on the market value of property. And, and look at what has happened to the market value of residential property in, the, in that 20-year period there. It went from uh, $16 billion to $90 billion. This is both appreciation and new construction, a five-fold increase. Commercial property, hey, it only tripled, right? And then all the other property, again, you know, all the ag, or the utility property, everything else except for residential and commercial, uh, it merely doubled. Another way to put it is if you look at the growth in the, t in the market value of taxable property, we're not talking about stocks and bonds, they're not in here, right? The market value of taxable property, 75% of that growth is just from the residential property. If you throw in commercial, you have like 87% of the growth in taxable value. So it's really not surprising that a larger part of our property taxes are coming from residential property than they were previously. Okay, uh, uh, another issue about the property taxes is does Montana rely just in general too much on the property tax? And th uh, this chart shows that uh, the typical state gets about 31% of its state and local tax revenues from the property tax. And Montana, for this particular year, the federal data say 37%. This is fiscal 13 as it happens. About 37%. In recent years, it's been up closer to 40% at some times. But at any rate, Montana does rely more heavily on the property tax than a typical state does. And some people argue that you know we rely too much on the property tax. But when you look at that and say, well, why do we rely more on the property tax? Look at the next two bars over there. The basic reason is that Montana does not have a general sales tax. So, you know, of course, Montana has a whole variety of uh, selective sales taxes or excise taxes, or sometimes they're called sin taxes. You know, they're on tobacco, alcohol, 
gambling and motel rooms. That's that's the those are the the four big ones here in Montana. Ah, oh, good. I got one that works. Okay, so. Okay, but still, when you when you when you take together, and, and we do have some resort taxes in a few small places, is what I would say, right? And they, and they're wonderful for like West Yellowstone, but in terms of the statewide table, to, totals, we're not talking about much here. Okay, so when you look at the the, the combined of uh, general sales taxes and uh, selective sales taxes, then you know Montana only gets less than half as much of its state and local tax revenue from those taxes as a typical state does. Um, Bob mentioned that I've been here since 1977 and uh, some of you are old enough to realize that this issue of a general sales tax has risen to the surface in Montana a number of times in the last 40 odd years. And so far the citizens of Montana had said no. So there we are. Could change, could change. But so far, that's where we are. The last one, of course, is in, in the last, in, in terms of do I pay more taxes than my neighbor does, people are concerned that their, the tax rates on their houses are higher than the tax rates that people pay in, in, in other states. And uh, so this is, a, this is something you can calculate in your head. It's called the effective property tax rate on owner-occupied housing. So you can take your property tax bill and uh, and divide it by the market value of your house. That's not what your father gave it to you for, the, the, the market value of your house, and express it as a percentage here. This is data from the Tax Foundation in Washington, D.C., who has made a survey of all the states and you know, tried to do it on a consistent basis for comparing the states. And they came up with a 0.86% as being the average effective property tax rate. I'm watching to see how many of you have your uh, cell phones out to calculate your, uh, okay. And, well, and I should say here, I want to emphasize that this is the average. I've had a number of people come up afterwards to explain to me that their property tax rate is higher than 0.86%. And I, I congratulated them on being above average, of course. But, <laughs> but half of the people are above average, right? Okay. And secondly, if you're in an urban area, you're paying city taxes, that also helps you to be above average. And for this particular group in Missoula, you're above average as well, just by being in Missoula. Okay, actually, Pat Barkey was suggesting we have a show of hands. I don't want to do that, but... Uh, it could be that everybody in this room is above average by this measure. That's, uh, that's entirely possible. But oh, anyway, that's the estimate of the average rate. That would rank us the 31st highest in the country. Uh, Idaho and Wyoming have lower rates. Uh, North Dakota and South Dakota have uh, higher rates. The, the median rate in the U.S., in the median state, is 1.04%. Uh, percent. So, uh, you know, it, it doesn't appear that property taxes in, in Montana on residential property are, are particularly high by uh, national standards. If anything, they're a bit below average. Okay, uh, fortunately we've run out of time and uh, uh, I, I don't mean to apply that, that, that everything is hunky-dory with the Montana's uh, property tax system. Uh, there are lots of things that citizens uh, could and perhaps should be engaged in discussing with their representatives. Some of these are definitely already uh, under discussion by legislative committees and, and, and local, uh, local uh, government officials as well. There's a whole list of them uh, up there. Let me, let me just talk about one and two for just one second here. I mean, these SIDs and fees, they have really grown tremendously in the last five or 10 years. And so kind of like, what's going on there? And part of it is that there are legislative restrictions on local governments in terms of what they can levy. And so sometimes people in a community say, I'd like my sidewalk repaired. And the city says, here's what we'll do. And there's that SID and levy. Is that a good thing? Is that a bad thing? Is that how we want to levy taxes? 
just more generally, how are we going to finance how much local government, including the schools? I mean, that's really the big one here. Okay, well, as I said, fortunately, we don't have enough time to deal with these, and so uh, I, I would be glad to take a question or two if there's any, any out there. I know what's going on is that relatively few of you have achieved emeritus status, and therefore you have to go back to work. <laughs> Anything? All right. Bye bye. Well, that uh, that's a heck of a way to end a program. We appreciate it. Thanks for coming. Come on next year for our 42nd. Uh, don't forget your evaluation forms. Drop them off as you go out if you would or leave them at your tables. Have a great day and a great year. So long.